Once upon a time. Welcome to Australian Book Lovers. Your destination for imagination. Australian Book Lovers acknowledges First Nations peoples and recognises their continuous connection to country, community and to culture. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and honour the sharing of traditional stories passed down through generations. We're committed to a safe and inclusive welcome for authors and readers of all cultures and backgrounds including people of LGBTQIA plus communities and their families. Adelaide made sure there wouldn't be a hair out of place when her son Stanley was due to arrive at her high rise. Half a can of hairspray was used to make certain each follicle obeyed like a loyal soldier. She applied the same green eyeshadow and shade of pink lipstick she had used for the last 50 years. And she chose a sensible yet stylish brown dress and white pearls as her outfit for the evening. Stanley could smell the roast as he entered. Tonight, it was beef. He couldn't recall if it was lamb or chicken the week before, as there was no predetermined order to which livestock would give up mortality for the dinner plate. To please his mother, he wore a tie tonight. You seem happier than usual, Stanley. Life's good, he replied. He wandered into her spacious apartment. The moonlight skipped on the ripples of the expansive ocean. Nature at its finest. Stanley thought, as he looked through the giant window in her dining room. The cleaner had done a sterling job, as always, in keeping all Adelaide's white furniture spotless. Adelaide poured two glasses of sherry. Why are you in such fine spirits? she asked. Has Francesco finally ended his secret affair? Mother! I don't know where you get that idea from. Just a hunch, and I'm never wrong about my hunches although I'm still not sure what you're doing with that man. Mother, I don't need to hear it again. I raised you to do better, and it's still early enough to leave. Move in here for a while until you get sorted out. And no matter who I fall in love with, they won't be good enough for you. You wouldn't leave Samuel alone, and he was worthy of your class. Our class, Stanley. It's our class. Do we need to have this conversation again? But darling... No. I'm serious, Mum. He got old six years ago. I love Frankie, and he loves me. Even in this seven-year itch period? We work through it our own way. Yes, by turning a blind eye to Francesco's adultery. Mother! Okay. I'll shut up about it. I wouldn't mind if you had proof, but all you have is a hunch. And yes, before you repeat yourself, I know you had that same hunch before Dad ran off. But seriously, I think I'd have that hunch too if Frankie was in love with someone else. You quivered. I what? You quivered halfway through your sentence. You have that same hunch. A big warm welcome to everyone and a huge thank you for joining us for the Australian Book Lovers podcast. Our mission is to bring fabulous Australian authors and Australian and Indigenous authors that uh, and books and literature that spans a whole range of genres to book lovers around the globe, as well as fantastic resources and information for passionate authors looking to write their next bestseller or their first bestseller. I'm Laurie Bell, science fiction and fantasy author, Friday Fictioneer, reader, and your co-host today for Australian Book Lovers, coming to you from Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung country. And <laughs> and nice, that smooth segue that we always have. Uh, I'm Veronica Strachan, aka V.E. Patton, uh, fantasy, science fiction, memoir, and picture book writer. Uh, not illustrator, but definitely writer, reader of uh, all of those genres just about that we uh, spoke about, coming to you also today from a lovely, sunny, Woiwurrung, Wadonjeri country up here in the Macedon Ranges for episode 124. 124. <laughs> a dozen dozen. How good is Amazing. that? Amazing. We are yeah. just zooming Talking along. <laughs> we are talking a lot. We are we, zooming we, along. 
It is yes. fantastic. I'm loving it. It is. And look, you know, more yeah. than 10,000 downloads. I haven't looked for a little while, but lots and lots and, you know, people uh, supporting us, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. It's just a great place that where we celebrate uh, Aussie authors. So I hope yes. you enjoy yeah. our chatter. And we and have chatter for you we today. We appreciate all of you. All of you lovely listeners and watchers, those that may have popped in to watch along with our, with our Indeed. crazy. <laughs> Indeed. And uh, I started the podcast, I will, I started the podcast with uh, something from the lovely Kevin Clare. And Kevin is an Australian author with, has a new audio book out through his American publisher, Nine Star Press, um, read by British narrator Lawrence Knott. Uh, and The Midnight Man is an urban fantasy about Stan, a man going through a midlife crisis who re-examines his life with the help of Asher, a guy who shows up in his dreams. The novel won the fantasy section of the short-lived Gay Scribe Awards and won in the LGBT category of the Paranormal Romance Guild's Reviewers' Choice Awards in the US. Uh, and so you got a little sneak preview of that at the beginning of the podcast. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, yes, lots of Fabulous Australian people. Over on Blue Sky, tell us, Laurie. We just chatted about that. Everybody says to yes, have migrated. Blue Sky is taking off. It is a lot of fun over there at the moment. I've got an account. Uh, I'm trying to convince the lovely Veronica <laughs> to have an account over there as well. We'll get, hopefully, an yep. ABL podcast yes. uh, Blue Sky up very shortly. Yeah, there's been a huge migration in this last week. Surprise, surprise. Uh, but it is taking off and there are so many writers, authors, writers, podcasts. There are script writers and play writers. And, they're, they're, and they've even got these fabulous little, they're called starter packs where you can go on someone's, whoever chooses to, can create a starter pack with all their favourite something or others whether it's authors sci-fi authors writers podcasters whatever have you it's amazing there's there's genres of all kinds with activities and interest groups and all sorts of things but you can jump onto a starter pack and just follow a heap of people all at once which is really exciting so I've had to mute my phone today because it is going off I've got followers <laughs> jumping on left right and center so I'm having a lot of fun over there that sounds good. Like the olden days in that Remain Nameless other yes. uh, site that was fantastic for authors and really just kind of fell over in a big way. But anyway, yeah. Exactly. And it's great because mm. it's wonderful to just support our fellow writers and, and promote their works and promote your own works and just see where writers are at. The community is building very quickly over there, as writers always do. Yes. And uh, it's a great platform. So at the moment, I'm enjoying that. So get okay. on with it. Okay, we, we will hope by the next, within the next couple of weeks, I'll get myself organised and we'll get Blue Sky happening. I, okay. I thought that then that might be, as you're saying that, I flicked mm -hmm. open the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows by John mm -hmm. Koenig and there's a word here called hem jawed, an adjective, feeling trapped inside your own language, struggling to shake away the baggage, weighing down certain words, unable to break out of its age-old structures and melodies, frustrated that the scattering of verbal pigments on its palate could never quite capture the colours in your head. And I thought, well, that's kind of a really nice description of that previous platform that shall we yeah, yes. <laughs> Absolutely right. So, mm -hmm. yes, well, that's a good word. Yes. I don't, so don't know if I remember it. Hem no, no. Oh, well, let me give you another one then. Mm -hmm. How about this one? Mm -hmm. Suerza, S-U-E-R-Z-A. This is a noun. And it's a feeling of quiet amazement that you exist at all. Ooh. A sense of gratitude that you were even born in the first place, that you somehow emerged alive and breathing despite all odds. And let me tell you as a midwife, I know the odds are amazing. Uh, having won an unbroken streak of reproductive lotteries that stretches all the way back to the beginning of life itself. And it's from the Spanish suerte, and which is luck, and fuerza, which is force. Sue Weza, a feeling like of quite that. amazement that you exist at all. I like that one too. There's a, there's a nice the little uh, sort of sci-fi fantasy uh -huh. kick there as a word. Uh -huh. But also 
the wonderful Finnegan that you talked to today. <gasps> yes. Uh, yeah, with, with the whole butterfly effect of one person's life affecting another person's life without them knowing. And yeah, so absolutely that's, amazing. Yeah, the fabulous that's fun. Finn uh, Crookemeyer and his dog Larry, who will be <laughs> clicking in the background. Uh, it was lovely chatting with Finn, and uh, yeah, we just went everywhere. You know, the because he's a theatre um, yeah. playwright. Playwright. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I accidentally called him a screenwriter, which very very politely corrected <laughs> me. No, no, sorry. Uh, quite different theatre mm. to screen, uh, but yes, mostly um, TYA theatre yeah. for young adults, and has theatre awards and uh oh, been translated into all sorts of languages and over yes. 100 plays it's yeah. amazing yeah all over the world so it was fabulous to chat with him um, about his first novel uh which i was lucky enough to have a read of uh the end Lovely. and everything before so that's coming up but first of all i think we do, need do, some do, news do, 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 do. yeah let's do it Can I jump in with a very quick shout out? Bit rude. I'm going to shout out to Lilydale Athenaeum Theatre Company, who are Woo-hoo. putting on a performance at the moment. And the performance that they're doing for the next three weeks is Little Women, which of oh. course is a book. Of so course. this is the the Broadway production of Little Women. But a big shout out to all the theatre companies at the at the moment who are doing a lot of book book references and adaptions that are going on but uh, they kicked off chookers for for this week they kicked off on Thursday night for the next two and a bit weeks so jump onto that if you've got an interest in uh book theatre and I think they're even doing they're doing Diary of Anne Frank next year so that's going to be amazing too so bring on the book adaptions yes (laughs) we have we've interviewed a number of authors uh, that have that kind of theatre connection aren't they yeah yes maybe there's just something in that need to perform for an audience or just get out there and get the 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 bring blood the words pumping. to life yeah bring, bring the, the words, words to life, to life. Yeah. we hear the, the the dialogue I guess yes. so there, there's there's yeah. there's a lot of connections with yeah with theatre folk and uh, yeah and I know the books. fabulous Emily Rayburn um, is part of the theatre world yeah. up in uh, the Australia Australia's capital in the mm-hmm. ACT uh, and yes has a beautiful speaking. And singing voice, I think. So there you go. All right. Any other news from you? Oh yes. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, I did have something. What did I have? I'm 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 jumping around all over the place today. I had something right in front of me which has dropped away. So here we go. Uh, oh yes. So Australia Reads had a spotlight. They've, they've had a couple of um, spotlights come up lately, but they've recently had a spotlight come up about uh, just reading and the support of teaching and reading of Australian literature in schools, Mm. which is really exciting. So they're, they're pushing, they're pushing a a big launch, particularly this year with uh, teachers registering for a free account on the Australian Reads site uh, to cover teaching, nearly 300 uh, teaching resources for Australian fiction, poetry, plays, non-fiction, graphic novels covering from foundation to senior and secondary school. Um, And there's units, there's curriculum units written for teachers. Jump on it. It is amazing. Uh, Sample classroom and assessment activities. There's links to other online resources. Um, And also First Nations writing representatives and Dovell. so yeah jump jump on onto that for all teachers librarians anyone who's introducing or wanting to talk about Australian books with uh, schools so jump on that the reading Australia website australiareads.org.au has the the article all about it um and a tiny little quick shout out to the Australian pen pals as well mm. where which is an initiative started by one of our lovely um interviewees uh, Kate Foster who yes, has put that fabulous. together so Australian authors can hook up with with uh, schools particularly uh, schools in need but also really any school and 
teachers that want to get involved where they have a author pen pal for their class for the year, which is a fantastic initiative as well. And there we go. Excellent. <laughs> so that, that was my news for this week. That's, that <laughs> is some excellent news. So let me tell you, I did a little scroll of the libraries mm -hmm. and Geelong libraries have got award-winning writer Anne Freeman running a writer's workshop called Stories with Spice. Coming up at the Geelong Library, and the you can jump onto the Geelong uh, Library website, and they are, and it's a, a one chili, <laughs> explores <laughs> what makes a successful spicy scene and how to craft one. Uh, and so you can jump on to, what is it, the Try Booking, uh, and uh, it says it's a one-hour interactive workshop. Uh, you'll gain an increased understanding of your ideal reader and how to cater to their desires using the fundamentals of good writing. From her little teak desk on Wadjetty land in Melbourne, Anne Freeman writes contemporary fiction about women who are stuck in life and the extraordinary ways they shake themselves loose. Her stories are always engaging and sometimes funny with reluctant adventures, sexy escapades and friendships that uplift. Uh, Anne's second novel, Me That You See, was shortlisted in 2022, uh, for the Hawkeye Publishing Manuscript Development Prize and long listed in the 2023 Grinstones Literary International Novel Prize. And it's now out with Hawkeye Publishing. So there you go. Um, I if, might need to get onto that. That's yeah, the one one part of my books that I yeah. fall into a puddle giggling stupidly to myself and then can't write. So yeah, <laughs> spice, can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> terrible, absolutely terrible at it. Love reading it. Terrible Love reading it. it. Yeah, and and. It, and how far do you go and, and you know, how, what do you leave to the imagination and all that kind of thing. So a big um, thing. My parents read my books. I, I can't. Yes. I can't do it. I giggle too much and then I fall into a heap, into a drive puddle. Yeah. 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 <laughs> It, it is a skill. It is definitely a skill. All right. Massive skill. Now, yep. actually, you know what? I'm going to give a shout out to uh, another theatre performance, it. which is happening. So it's not related to a book, but it is kind of related, I guess, to, uh, you know, Anne Freeman's work. Shimmery Burlesque uh, is has been invited back to the Athenaeum. And, uh, yes, this is my son's partner, Holly, uh, the fabulous Holly Mewitt and her story of her mother and her uh, journey from seamstress to fabulous uh, designer of brilliant uh, burlesque and uh, and drag uh, uh, costumes as well. So it's on at the Athenaeum. It's at the end of November, and there's only four shows. So jump on quickly because the Athenaeum invited them back because it was so popular last time. So if you want to get a ticket, get yourself there. If you're looking for a new Christmas um, work thing, Go out to dinner, go to a show. Do it. Yeah, Do it. There, and there is nothing better. Same with same with Ludo, because they they yes. have deals with uh, some of the local restaurants as well. So yes, and you can get a group don't discount. Don't know if yes. they still do, but you can. Yes, dinner and a dinner and a show with some yeah. of the restaurants in Lilydale. But also, uh, I think it's just theatre is a great thing. It it takes you it out of the moment, and it's these are amazing amateur shows but they're so well crafted and they're so yes. well acted um yes. and it's only 20 20 10 20 30 dollars so it's you're getting a show you're getting a night out you're getting a glass of champers and <laughs> you know you, it's a good night out and, yes and, and you're think, supporting artists this you is are the supporting thing local artists as well local artists yes um, mm. holly is a melbourne uh I won't say girl, she's a Melbourne woman. So there you go. Ah, Wonderful. Oh, trying to be better. All right. And our final piece of news is that the Booker Prize was won by Samantha yes. Harvey. And that's worth $97,000 for her book, <gasps> Orbital, talking about science fiction. Mm. Um, and published Although, by the... isn't it interesting? They're not wording it as no, science fiction no, in all the promotion. I of course. have had an issue with that this week. It's like, oh, it's literary <gasps> fiction that's set in space. Really? It's just science, science fiction, fiction, people. Get over yourselves. <laughs> We've had this discussion before. Okay. And genre books can win awards. Genre Look, is amazing. She's just won like $97,000. We all love to read it and yep. Yep, just call it what it is, people. <laughs> 
All right. Sorry, I have issues. <laughs> I can understand it. So Orbital takes place over a single day in the life of six astronauts and cosmonauts aboard the International Space Station. Um, so you're compact, yet beautifully expansive. Orbital invites us to observe Earth's splendor whilst reflecting on the individual and collective value of every human life. Okay, uh, let me just go. Harvey's written a novel. Uh, this is for uh, by DeWall, who must have been on the panel. Uh, oh, Edmund DeWall, uh, the, uh, said one of the judge, chair of the judging panel. Harvey has written a novel propelled by the beauty of 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets. Everyone and no one is a subject. As six astronauts in the International Space Station circle the Earth, observing the passages of weather across the fragility of borders and time zones. With her language of lyricism and acuity, Harvey makes our world strange and new for us. Um, said Harvey of writing Orbital, I thought of it as a space pastoral, a kind of nature writing about the beauty of space. That was very nice anyway. That's nice. So, yes, that's good. So well done. Good luck to her. And, of course, we did have an Australian in the shortlist, which was Stonia, yes. devotional by Australian author Charlotte Wood. Uh, yes, so that's fantastic. All right, enough news. We know what's next. We are moving to five book spotlights because we have so many lovely Australian authors loading their books on the website. Let's go straight to Beam of Light by John Kinsella. This is a contemporary anthology. Shifts in tone, setting and narration create a sense of the uncanny in Beam of Light, Kinsella's haunting collection of stories. A man is disturbed by the sight of a familiar dining table and chairs atop an impending bonfire of bulldozed trees. A girl finds a fox skeleton and feels compelled to protect its spirit by dispersing its bones over the valley. A couple are invited to dinner by Christians new to town, an occasion that quickly turns heavy and strange. Two men awkwardly meet again when their daughters attend the same ballet class, and a man and a woman struggle to balance the threats of addiction and poverty with the joys and hopes of a new baby. Stories range in location from Ireland to Germany to Greece to the Australian countryside, threatened by catastrophic heat, land clearing, housing estates and strip malls, and can sell us characters so often on the edge, sear the consciousness. So some praise for John's writing. The stories never forget they were written on land with history, Aboriginal land that was stolen, and the blood that was shed, and the skin of colonisation over a deep pass. That's from Rachel Watts in Westerly. There you go. Lovely. All right, tell us about John. Excuse me while I have a male walk across my screen. <laughs> <laughs> it's like she's settling down now. Okay. Uh, so the bio for John Kinsella lives on Ballad Balladong Noongar land at Jam Tree Gully, love that name, in Western Australia Wheatbelt, and has also lived in the USA, UK, Ireland, and other zones. His recent publications include the poetry volumes, the uh, uh, Argonaut, uh, no, no, uh, Argonautia. I've said that completely wrong in, in Landica. Oh my goodness. Sorry about that. Spirals Collected po Poems, Volume 3. So I'm assuming there's Volume 1 and 2, maybe. Um, the previous story collections, including the awards listed Pushing Back Transit Lounge 2021 and Old Growth Transit Lounge 2017. His first novel, Cell Night, was published in by Transit Lounge in 2023. So that's Very John good. Kinsella. Yeah, and we gave away a copy of Beam of Light. Oh. Uh, not this oh, did newsletter, we? but the one before. We did. It was really beautiful cover. I'm looking. Yeah, we definitely gave it away. Now, I want – can you can you <laughs> say that one? I, I feel really bad for not saying that oh, – pronouncing that properly. The Argonautica. The Argonautica in Landica. In Landica. Argonautica in Landica. There we go. Landica. Yes. Beautiful. Excellent. Thank you, John. <laughs> All right. Number two is The Postman's My Mate by Callie Louise Jarris, and this is a children's picture book. Join Charlie on an adventure as he unwraps a world filled with surprises and imagination. When his very best mate, the postman, arrives with a mysterious package, Charlie's day transforms into the best birthday ever. What's inside? Rockets, pirates, dinosaurs, or something entirely unexpected. 
So educators and principals recommend The Postman's My Mate for its educational value and narrative, oh, and entertaining narrative. This fun story with all watercolours hand-painted using locally sourced paints is a quirky tale designed to captivate kids and adults alike. Perfect for providing teacher notes, delve into Charlie's adventure and discover the surprise inside the box. So Kelly Louise Jarris is based in the Macedon Ranges, which is Wurundjeri country. <laughs> Her books have captured the imaginations of young readers and earned admiration from parents and educators alike. Among her celebrated works is Wonderful Wishes, illustrated by the late Rosie Sale, which takes readers on delightful bedtime adventures. That sounds like fun. Imagine Our Special Place, dedicated to her late sister Charlene, features illustrations by Sandukia, uh, no, Oh, sorry, Sand Kia. Yep, yeah, maybe I got that right. Descend <laughs> Yaki and tells the touching story of two sisters who embark on whimsical adventures in the sky. Oh, love it. Cheese on Toast, a fun and engaging read illustrated by Badinga Adra and has been picked up by notable retailers such as Collins and Readings. See. Seasons of View, also illustrated by Sanduka Disanyaki, beautifully captures the journey of motherhood and has resonated deeply with many readers. Her recent book, The Postman's My Mate, has been well received with its with both its stunning illustrations and imaginative settings. Kelly Louise Jarris's work is characterized by her heartfelt writing, vivid imagination and joyful connection she creates with her readers. Her books are not only stories, but cherished memories for children and parents alike. There you go. And the um, I know that my children remember some of our books that we read over and over and over again, and uh, we can narrate them almost without even looking at the book these days. So they do become cherished memories, some of those little ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, book three, Murder yes. at the Tennis Club by Rita Lee Chapman is a mystery. See, I told you we have books for everybody in every do genre, we, don't we? we do. So, <laughs> <laughs> Murder at the Tennis Club is a D.I. Mark Williamson detective story. So D.I. Mark Williamson and his wife, Christine, moved from Sydney to the Sunshine Coast in Queensland, Australia, for a quieter lifestyle. Serious crime is low and Mark finds time to join the local tennis club. But peace in this idyllic area is shattered when a woman is found murdered in her own home. Can Mark find Faye Abbott's killer and is her death linked to the murders which occur shortly afterwards at the tennis club? Do, do, do. Mm. Yes, nice one. So, Queen, so Queensland's not quite, quite as quiet as you no. want it to be. <laughs> Rita Lee Chapman is an Australian author of 12 books. The latest, Murder at the Tennis Club, is a detective story. She's also published the Anna Davis mystery series, Winston, A Horse's Tale, The Poincatia Tree and Dangerous Association. Sorry, bug in my face. My, <laughs> and her three children's books are The Unicorn Angel, Frankie the Unicorn Who Couldn't Fly, and My Very Naughty Pony. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. So, yeah, it's Rita so has uh, a, a great breath by the looks of it there. That's fantastic. Mm. Yeah. Book four is The Power of Content by Mel Daniels, and it is a non fiction book. And not just a book, it's a journey through the content effect framework and a powering guide to creating content authentically in alignment with your strengths. In a world where we're constantly bombarded with shoulds from so called experts, this book helps you break free from the pressure to conform and shows you how to make content creation easy, enjoyable, and purpose driven. When Mel made the leap from corporate world to full time mum to online entrepreneur, she saw too many entrepreneurs struggling with their content. They were caught in a cycle of trying to implement strategies from experts left and right, but there were some missing pieces strategy, purpose, and personality. Content creation had become a burdensome task disconnected from their true passions and values. And the power of content is her response to the struggle. In the book, she invites you to embrace your uniqueness and bring it to the forefront of your content. It isn't about following a rigid formula or trying to mimic someone else's success. Instead, it's about discovering your voice, your strengths, and using them to create content that feels aligned, meaningful, and true to you. So I think there would be some good things in here for writers as well. Yeah, because... Yeah, one of the foremost issues of the power of content is that content is not just about making sales. It's about building relationships, understanding your audience, and more importantly, understanding who you are as a person. When you create content from this heart-centered place, you'll find that content creation becomes easier and less of a chore. 
There you go. So Mel Daniels, the power of content. Tell us about Mel. So Mel Daniels is described as someone who listens and cares about you as a human being. So it is no surprise that when she delved into the online business world, that she would follow a path to shift the transactional narrative of content marketing to one that values the human. Her purpose is to teach and empower purpose-led women who want more from their business on how to use content in a genuine way. Mel gives them the confidence they need to become more visible, seen as an, as the expert that they are and inspired to take their business to the next level in a way that feels more aligned to their values and beliefs. Mel also believes that even when the pathway isn't clear, diving in and working it out in the most imperfect way is often the most perfect way. With this methodology in mind, Mel has increased the confidence of countless women through her membership, the content effect, uh, one to one cons uh, consulting and her podcast, The Powerful Content Podcast. Her intent to spread the message far and wide has seen Mel featured on numerous content, uh, numerous podcasts, my apologies, both at home and abroad. When she is not talking about content, which isn't often, you'll find her cheering on her clients and community from the sidelines with an almond flat white in one hand and her famous chocolate chip cupcake in the other. Yum. Today she runs an online business from her Sydney home where she lives with her husband Adam, two beautiful teenagers and dingo dog Ellie. Very so good. And I in fact know. met Mal. Oh. Um, she was one of the people in the audience at the City Authors Inc. event that oh. I was up in uh, a little while back. So, yes, Fantastic. you were talking books. I said, absolutely, drop your book onto the website, which she yeah, has, sure. and she's now following uh, Australian Book Lovers Podcast, which is great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, <laughs> we as writers, if we – if we write our social media all about our interests, in my case, and our sci-fi, yeah. it's so much more fun to do. Of course it is. And then it doesn't, it's not onerous. It's like, yeah, it's just sharing the story. Because it is a lot of work. Indeed. <laughs> all right. We have Conquest by Dirk Strasser, a uh, speculative fiction, portal fantasy, alternative alternative history. So Love take a, a good bit. portal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love a good portal fantasy. So Capitan Cristobal de Vargas' drive for glory and gold in 1538 Peru leads him and his army of conquistadors into a new world that refuses to be conquered. He is a man torn by lifelong obsessions and knows this is his last campaign. What he doesn't know is that his Incan allies, led by the Princess Sarpe, have their own furtive plans to make sure he never finds the golden city of Vilcambamba. So praise for conquest, deep characters and a historic odyssey and enchanting stories splash with darkness and light. And that's from Eugene Bacon, one of our other fabulous ABL friends and a great writer in her own right. Uh, she's the, uh, of course, the World Fantasy Award finalist and award-winning author of Dang Black Thing, Major Fools and Chasing Whispers and so many more. Mm -hmm. Tell us Dirk's bio because we know a little bit about Dirk. Yes, absolutely. So Dirk has written over 30 books. He has won multiple Australian Publisher Association Awards at Dittmar for Best Professional Achievement and has been shortlisted for the Australis, uh, sorry, Aurelis and Dittmar Awards a number of times. His short story, The Doppelganger Effect, appeared in the World Fantasy Award winning anthology Dreaming Down Under. His acclaimed fantasy series, The Books of Ascension, sent Equinox and Eclipse, was published by Pan Macmillan in Australia and by Hein Verlag in Germany. His fiction has been translated into a number of languages. He founded the Oralis Awards and has co-published Oralis, Australian fantasy and science fiction for over 20 years. Which so, is absolutely brilliant. So yeah. thank you, Dirk. We absolutely appreciate that. And we have him on the list for a chat a little bit down the list, but oh, we're, we're getting to as many people as we can and we yeah. will uh, make sure that we uh, yes. we chat with uh, with Dirk very soon. Okay, Absolutely. so that is five, five, you know, could you get better? You've got a, a speaking of fiction portal fantasy. You've got a beautiful nonfiction to tell you all about content. You've got a murder amazing mystery, pitch. your amazing picture amazing book, pitch book, and yeah. a lovely contemporary anthology. I mean, there are so yeah, many amazing. brilliant Australian authors. And so. we have so many books on our list for giveaways too. Yes, yes, yes. I was a bit slow. So uh, I've just given away uh, four books and I've still got, oh, still got a stack of um, uh, books to give away. So I'm going to try and do my newsletter uh, a little bit more than uh, once a month, which is good. And because good. books make good 
gifts for Christmas. Let's talk about absolutely. That for a and look, we are we are creeping up to Christmas. Is six weeks away. I don't like putting that out loud because it makes me think it's going to go <laughs> way too fast. But the great thing about books, of course, is not only do they make amazing gifts. But they are also so easy to wrap. If yeah. you are looking for something last minute that, and you're a terrible present wrapper like I am, they are so easy to wrap. They are terrific. Books for kids, you can jump on. Get There are so many amazing picture books that also easy to wrap. It's a square. It's a rectangle. It's so easy. Jump on it. Um, and, of course, if you're not wrapping, they go great in, in gift bags as well. Yes, speaking, and easy speaking, to post. Speaking of gift bags, check out this little beauty that I got during the week, which is our tote bag. I hope you can see that. That, Yes, for anybody listening, it's a beautiful, uh, you could look green with the lovely ABL post on it. (laughs) Absolutely love it. Oh, yes, sorry. I should describe (laughs) things for our actual (laughs) listeners. Um, I've also got a lovely little notebook, which is also uh, read more. Aussie books with the hashtag and uh, the ABL logo. Uh, what else? Oh, and I've got a I've got a coffee mug. Coffee yeah. mug. <laughs> and of course, our lovely shirts. We, Merchandise, uh, guys. Wearing, we would indeed, indeed. I've got a. a we would uh, love your support coloured. if you are a fan of the podcast or our YouTube channel. You yes. can grab merch again. Great Christmas presents, easy to Great wrap. Great Christmas presents, yes. Yeah, and you, the, all of the genres, the, our lovely little logos have uh, their own. Uh, you can get yes. them in uh, like, with black writing, white I'm writing. I'm wearing the fantasy one thing. today and yeah, check and out I've got, that little I've got book ABL on mine, read yep. my Aussie book. So if you're buying for overseas, this is one of the most unique gifts that you can give is uh, a, a T-shirt or a cap yes. or a hand towel or a scarf covered in little Australian um Animals, we know, kookaburra, platypus, emu. If you are a reader of Aussie books and you love love your reading and you don't have the cash to splash, and fair enough, no one's got the cash to splash this year, um, a review on your favourite writer's latest book, any book, any review, it's free for you to do and it really helps us out as authors and gets Absolutely. word around about our books. And, yeah. hey, it's free. It's yes, free and easy. One borrow, line, a couple of stars. Borrow the book from the library if you can't afford to buy Libraries, it. And absolutely. create a book club and talk about it to two yes. friends and then they can borrow it from the library. And then yeah. it just goes on and on. And that is, Or tell the people at work or tell yeah. the people. Yeah. And, do you know, I train, I travel the train to work every day and the number of books I see by readers on trains, oh, it's marvellous. I actually saw uh, – uh, uh, Trent Dalton the other day sitting sitting on the uh on on the train they were reading reading uh very enthralled I must say and I tell yeah. you there's some there's some hot boys reading books on trains I'm just <laughs> I'm just saying that you know <laughs> so just yeah. any kind of yeah word of mouth or just to be seen ready and actually do you know what sorry I'm gonna get on my my little so so box um so a regular reminder with books not only do kids n- just need to see books and and feel books and touch books and play with them and and everything but they they also need some modeling from parents and you know right reading getting yourself a book for christmas and having the kiddies see you reading for pleasure that is a massive thing at the moment there, there's been a few reports this week come out about the fact that kids are not reading for for pleasure, they're not seeing books um, as something that is a pleasurable activity and modelling is something that parents can do without even thinking if they've got a book, get a book for yourself. And you know what? It's a great way to escape the kids for a little while if you're needing to do that too. Uh, and it's it's great modelling. And I, I mean, I got into books because I saw my grandparents reading all the time and, and they would take me to the library. So school holidays are coming up. Libraries are yes. open. Yes, summer on the beach. It. Yeah, show you need how book. much fun it is to, to read a book and then they'll – see that as something they might want to do too so yes well I am the great auntie who always gives books for gifts so you can pretty much oh, guarantee oh so am I which the they nieces. don't always get 
totally excited about on the day, but it's the book that it's the gift that gives over and over. And of course, yeah. then they, they yeah. are seeing them, uh, the, reading them over and over. And yeah. if they come to my house, they want to read Chickabella. Read Chickabella, Auntie Ronnie. Okay. That's so cool. And reading out loud to kids is so much fun. It is. Especially if you do the voices. You've got yes. to do the voices, people. And, it, you know, we're all stressed. We're all busy. We're all, you know, having the, the, the stressful mental health focus. And you know what? Reading out loud to kids is a great way to de-stress as well. And, and it is. It's and just escape. Great you fun. Say. Give them a cuddle at the same time. It's wonderful. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> Sorry, jump off my soapbox yeah, now. Uh, rant complete. Thank yeah, you. Rant complete. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think that, right. oh, did we say you can follow us on uh, Instagram and threads at Australian Book Lovers? We're on and LinkedIn, soon we're to on be YouTube, and soon to be Blue soon Sky. Soon to be Blue Sky. <laughs> Keep your eye out for us on Blue Sky coming soon. And, of course, follow Laurie Bell on Blue Sky. She's already there. Yes. Uh, yes. Although, stop you know, texting her during the recording. That's yes. I, yeah, I, like I said, it's, it's, I, whoa. Oh yeah. I won't look at that. Don't look at that. Yep. <laughs> we now want to jump into the uh, interview that I had, the yes. discussion that I had with, with Finn. Uh, fabulous uh, Finn Cookemeyer. So yes. um, when I, I realized that I read a different blurb for him. So I'm just going to say, uh, read his blurb for the end and everything before it now. Emma watched her mother's kayak disappear among icebergs in the Arctic Sea. Six years later, her brother, who'd not spoken since the mother was lost, warns Emma of the curse of death that she brought to anyone who looked on her face before tragedy befalls him too. Emma consigns herself to a solitary life at sea where she can do no more harm. After years alone, she's mysteriously drawn to land and she docks at an island, afraid of what her arrival might mean for the welcoming man and his daughter waving from the jetty. But who knows where our stories begin and end or how they are entwined? Who knows whether now, on the island, she begins a new tale or takes a role in a story that began generations ago with a feast in the forest or a chest of gold coins plunged into the sea or an orphan in a bookshop beguiled by an elusive and troubled woman. So there you go. It is a, you know, a, a sweeping, joyous novel about love, loss and the power of stories and uplifting journey into our deepest humanity. And I would have to absolutely agree. I would give it five stars. So Lovely. let's go and talk with Finnegan Kukamaya. Welcome, book lovers. We have with us all the way from South Australia, the fabulous Finnegan Crookemeyer. Welcome to Australian Book Lovers, Finn. Thanks very much. Lovely to chat. Now, I'm here on Wadangeti Woiwurrung Country, and uh, there are mobs all over the place. Whose country are you on over there in South Australia? I'm Ghana land over here. Uh, beautiful. Yeah, the, the land of Darren Cass and Co., one of our uh, co founders and presenters. So uh, lovely. How's the weather over there? It's oh, it's a bit grey today. My yeah. son's not at school, so he'll be yeah. lamenting the inability to get uh, out of the, on the yard too much. But yeah, it's all right. It's okay. it's all right. Yeah. Uh, at the moment in Victoria, of course, it's it's reasonable and actually quite sunny. But you know, give us five minutes and we could be raining, uh, as we were last night. We had some big storms here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We have. A book to talk about, which is the end and everything before it, but there is so much more to Finn than your first novel. You know, to say that you're a debut author is yeah, a little, a little bit <laughs> ingenuous. So <laughs> I'm going to start people with Finn's bio, which is that he was born in Ireland and moved halfway around the world to Adelaide, aged eight. Uh, a decision that obviously he didn't have a lot to do with. Otherwise, his parents might have moved into Melbourne, the the best country in the, the best city in the world. Anyway, more on that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So after 15 years, he and his wife left for the island state of Tasmania. Absolutely beautiful. Lived down there a couple of years myself. Okay. And after 15 more with their son, Mo, they returned to Adelaide. Uh, now, Finn is an award-winning playwright whose works have been performed on six continents and in eight languages. And that is a very short sentence to sum up an absolutely incredible body of work. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Let's start with what brought you 
to the novel. So before all of that, all of that writing and the the screenplays and all of the things, um, yeah. I know that there's a sense, there's a thread, there's a common thread that for me looking at all of your beautiful plays for children that draws into your novel. But tell me what started you on the screenplay writing road? Uh, uh so the the theatre writing, the play sorry, writing. the theatre writing, yes, yeah, yes. cool. Um, screenplay is another, sorry. yeah, it's another. Doing, sorry, that. yes, <laughs> but, um, I'm very green in that area. Um, yeah. uh, the playwriting kicked off because yeah, so I arrived in Adelaide when I was eight years old, and I'd lived on a quite isolated hilltop in in regional Southern Ireland. Uh, so I had lots of books. I was reading all the time, but um, but in terms of uh, social extracurricular interactions there wasn't much like I was seeing my mates at school but then the rest of life was kind of pretty yeah rural and um and suddenly I was in Adelaide and there was a youth theater and so I discovered everything that came with that and this lovely community of people and we were all kind of aspiring fledgling actors and then I did that for a few years and then kind of realized in time which was good that I'm not an actor uh, I, I don't really want to be an actor and and in actuality it was the words that were the the great pleasure for me and I just hadn't made that correlation that the reading had kind of blurred kind of osmotically into this next thing I was doing and so I had a, a great director friend and she gave me my first commission um, mm -hmm. to write a play for that youth theatre company. So when I was 18 years old and then from there, I just kind of kept getting these commissions from other youth theatres and then into adult theatre companies and then professional companies making works for young audiences. And that became the, the good majority of the plays that I've written have been for young people as brought to life by professional ensembles. Um, yeah, and that's been 20 years. I've had 20 really lovely years of, of being a playwright. Are you continuing to do that or is novel writing, have you fallen in love with that and you're ready to dive further? <laughs> I'm, I'm at this funny moment in time where yeah. yeah, um, pragmatically and professionally and, and also artistically, like I do still really love what it is to write a play and to see a play come to life, that immediacy of watching an audience meet the work in real time, watching an amazing ensemble of people bring it to life, add all those other elements to a to a quite boring two-dimensional words on a page script, the way that they then fill it with life and breathe life into it is just a magic trick over and over again. So I'll never, I'll never get sick of that. But the discovery of what it is to write a novel of of sitting in it so heavily and for such a period of time and and exploring these great swathes of information that go back and forth and giving yourself a couple of years in which to really nut out a story in that way I've just discovered it to be such a pleasure so whether anybody wants another novel or not, you know, like a, <laughs> remains uh, to be that's seen a, totally that's a whole other thing but, uh, but I think in terms of the pleasure I feel and also the 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 newness of it the how green I feel doing it and how lovely that feels the risk the fear yeah. that not knowing the discovering an art form in real time yeah I think books are my my pleasure for a while excellent in fact let's go back to childhood because you did send me some beautiful responses and I, I do want to say uh, ask you know when did you first admit that you were a writer of any description mm. Okay, um, so yeah, I think I uh, I discovered the that words were a conversation quite early on. So so initially, I thought that words were things for taking in, and that they fed you in that way, and that they they kind of opened up this sense of other worlds and and let you walk in other characters' shoes and and all these different pleasures. And then also quite early, maybe in my I don't know when I was nine or ten, I started just speculating on what it was to, to write and to put words out into the world in different formative ways. And that became another pleasure in itself. And so it took the form of initially poetry I was writing. And then I was getting really into stand-up comedy and watching stand-up comics. So I started writing comedy. And then from about 15, I was going to clubs and being a comedian um, <laughs> amongst these very generous adults and and having a whole other life doing stand-up comedy. Um, and then 
and then plays started to take shape probably from around 15 or so, just kind of in amateur ways with my mates. And then, yeah, as a commission thing from about 18. So, so just that, just, yeah, the generosity of words, the inherent loveliness of words that they, they can be born of anything by anyone for anyone and they can exist for grand vast audiences or they can exist for you and you alone and they're just a they're just a great um yeah I don't know a lovely balancing thing and I I'll never tire of of the sense of of lovely democracy that they provide that is beautifully said and I'm also so, uh, looking here that you had a pint with your dad recently and he was reminiscing that you first told him it was your occupation when you were four <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. That's true, actually. And there is a there's a photo of me. I'm sitting in the backyard in Irish farmland, sitting cross legged, uh, leaning, pouring over a, a piece of writing that I'm trying to manifest, and you know, looking really studious, <laughs> like I'm trying to crack this idea, whatever it might have been, yeah, however flippant or earnest or whatever it was. Um, yeah, and that would have been about five or so. Yeah. So yeah, so yeah, fantastic. It's, it's a it's a pleasure when you can know the thing that you love from early on. I think that's always mm-hmm. been really I've I've had a very lucky life and one of the the great gifts is that sense of just inherent knowing. Well, mm. you know, not always mm. like in a financially lucrative way. I've had lots of badly no <laughs> kicking around as an artist and being fine with that, but just yeah. knowing the thing I loved has been has been a great gift. Fantastic. And your favorite book as a child, I loved that. You, you, yeah. Do you uh, remember what you told me? Yeah, I'm trying to think. Was it Emil and the Detective? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I haven't heard of that one for such a long time, but it, it was one of my favourites as well. So, uh, yeah, just, just brilliant. Isn't it funny how stories capture us and there is mm. that uh, kind of fantasy of another world, yeah. be it a, a realistic world or whatever, and yeah. we can just immerse ourselves and, and step away from oh, okay. siblings or problems or you know, yeah. food or chores or whatever it is, and just, <laughs> yeah, just it's it's rich. The ability of authors to change our lives is fantastic. Totally. And I, I love the power dynamics in that book. I remember, I, I think I can still viscerally remember reading that as a kid and going, you know, like there's these nefarious adults who are kind of, you know, thieving and, and mm. unscrupulous. And then there's these cool, bolshy kids who are kind yeah. of getting together <laughs> and, and writing wrongs. And I'm like, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, like, like the child as the hero, not as somebody to be saved by a caring adult, which is, of course, so much of, of how the world operates. And thank God for that. Mm-hmm. But, um, but the fact that they could be, you know, arbiters, deciders of their own fate. It's yes, cool. yes. It feels empowering. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. All right. So let's look at the threads that take you from uh, writing youth theatre. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, as you said, there's, there's often kind of, you know, messages in those but sometimes it's nice just to sit and watch and and be absorbed in the performance I really liked your thoughts there so what then drew you to write the end and everything before it your first novel yeah okay so years ago there was a character called Emma the Greek who turned up in a play I wrote for adults it was a commission for Duke Theatre up in Cairns and um, and it was brought to life by a wonderful actress called Natalie, and, I, and she just kind of evoked the character so richly. And it was it was this uh, young woman who's encumbered by this sense of of tragedy she carries that people she sees die soon after, and so she rationalizes that if she sets to see for a long time, she can give her sick father a long life. Her absence mm. will be the the salvation of others around her, or not around her. Course. And um, and uh, of course it doesn't go as planned. She she sails for many years, but eventually rocks up beside a shore, sees a man with his daughter on his shoulders, and they wave her in, and she goes in, and her life begins. And and the story was satisfied to some point in the context of the play, like you met Emma for a, for a period of time amongst other characters. But she lingered and I wanted to know more about what happened and what that landing place was and and the life that unfolded from there. So I waited for years for permission to write the book. I applied for grants and I tried to set aside periods of time and life always got in the way and 
being a father and a husband and writing plays and, you know, just being in a community. It never came to be. And then three years ago, my um, my then partner, she got really sick and she had to go to bed for a year. And so my life became very simple and small and it was nursing her and uh, raising our son. And that was essentially what I was doing. And I'd also bought Larry, who you can hear scuttling around <laughs> as we're having this chat, only yes. a week before. So he was a puppy and he woke at four every morning. And so from four till six, I had to placate him. I had to be with him for two hours and keep him quiet while the humans I loved in my household slept. And I needed something to do for two hours every morning. So without any money and without any permission and without anybody saying I could, uh, I and born of kind of tragedy and fear and stress, I wrote this book and it poured out in two months in these two hour increments and the whole thing just came to be. So it's one of those moments where the art dictates when the art gets made. You can't you can't be the decision maker around it. And so so it just turned up. And there it was. All right. For our listeners and watchers, I'm going to share the uh, bio of the end and everything before it. An unforgettable debut novel from one of Australia's most internationally celebrated playwrights. A woman fears she carries a curse of death. A freed prisoner finds purpose and community by hosting a banquet in the forest. A young girl digs up long lost coins from beneath her house and an orphan finds a sense of belonging in a bookshop. Who knows where our stories begin and end or how they are entwined? Who knows whether we begin a new tale or take a role in a story that began generations ago with a feast or a chest of gold coins plunged into the sea or an orphan beguiled by the elusive and troubled woman? And the end and everything before it is a kaleidoscope portrait of a community across generations set in a small coastal town. Finnegan Crookemeyer's uplifting and startling novel explores our deepest humanity. It's sweeping. It's a sweeping, joyous novel about love, loss, and the power of stories. And a, a beautiful review by Caradwin Dovey says, bursting with wisdom and poetry, this novel reminds us that storytelling is a moral force and a salve to every lost soul. Mm. There you go. And and I think that beautifully sums it up. Yeah. Oh, she, yeah, she was so generous. Just amazing. Just having a read of it before it went out into the world and, and offering up those words. It was such a gift. Yeah, fantastic. And so Emma the Greek in the book is joined by many other fantastic characters forward and back in time. So there's a little element of, um, for me, it just had an echo of the time traveller's wife, just the, mm -hmm. the little, you know, looking forward, looking yeah. back and where you are and throwing you in and out of the story so that you had to to concentrate. And, at, you know, in typical author fashion, you just get us interested and then you'd cut us off and throw us into another character. And I think, <laughs> oh, I have to read this one now, quick to get to the, and what happened to the last person. So... <laughs> Was those two hours uh, an easy, joyous ride, or was it a struggle for Emma to let them into your mm -hmm. into your story? Yeah, great question. I um, I think that I just gave myself permission. I think in all those like those moments that feel really conducive to writing, where you sit down with intent at the keyboard and then you look up and a period of time has passed and a character has manifested themselves or a problem has been solved or a problem has been created. And you know you're going to have to nut that out when you sit down next time. Um, all of those feel like a pleasure. And I think the book was very much the result of that. It was this very unconscious style of writing. And, and it, it felt like a cumulative exercise. So I was writing these insights into different characters, as you alluded to, kind of quite, um, um, yeah, sectionally sometimes, and then hoping that uh, the answer would reveal itself, that if I wrote in this way for long enough, there would be a coming together and the world would explain itself back to me. And I, and I think that the exercise kind of bore fruit in that way with, it must be said, huge assistance from Jane, my editor at Text, 
what I gave her initially was such a compendium of moments and characters and fragments. And what she did was, was be this lovely conduit between what an audience receives and what the writer intends. And um, yeah, she, she really helped explain the shape of it back to me in a way that I could then write to. Um, so so the way in gold, good editors, aren't they? Totally, totally. Yes. And, and long may our relationship be. <laughs> we're, we're chatting about second ones at the moment. And okay, I, good. I think her brain is just such an amazing, uh, clever thing, yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, it was kind of a faith-based exercise um, for this atheist boy, which was just to um, just let the writing take shape as it needed, let the characters kind of tell me what they cared about and lean into that. And what I realised quite quickly, and it's the thing that isn't so much a, an aspect of the plays that I write, was that place was a character in itself. All of these divergent, disparate people were arriving and the place of arrival was becoming more and more important with each, each writing day I did. And so suddenly the landscape became this really crucial uh known part of the whole exercise and and kind of provided for me eventually the answer to it all suddenly the landscape became became the thing yes and a little surprising end which we won't have any spoilers about thank you uh, very much we'll keep people going all right so one of the questions we ask is do you write for yourself or a particular audience so uh what is your response to to that one? Mm -hmm. um, I write for an audience. Like I, I, I think if I were to simplify, because I could get into the minutiae of that, I think, but I think most simplistically, art is made to be received. Unless it's true catharsis, unless you're really yeah. sitting in a moment to unpack it for yourself and it's mm -hmm. it's providing a tool in that way and art can mm -hmm. totally do that and i mm -hmm. i have total respect for that but the art that i tried to make um is really about being received eventually by somebody that said within that i try not to put parameters on who that audience is or what they might actually be receiving i acknowledge that to be an audience member to be an eater upper of art is an intensely personal experience and that everybody comes to every artistic interaction, whether opening a book or sitting in a theatre or turning on a record player, they come encumbered with their own baggage, with their own lives, with their own sense of what's important, with people they like or hate, with aspects of themselves they like or hate. And so I just offer a thing to them and, and whatever they see it to be important uh, whatever aspect they see to be important is totally their right and it's not even for me to ask so I make it for an audience but I never want to know who that audience is mm, interesting tell me about the difference between for you uh, writing theatre or writing for young people primarily mm -hmm. and what is now a novel for an adult book and you talked a little bit earlier about the the newness and the lovely learning of a, a different creative process but mm -hmm. what what have you loved most about you know drawing away from young mm -hmm. people drawing into an adult understanding yeah okay uh I think my distinction for me is more around what it is to write theater and what it is to write uh, books as opposed to for young mm -hmm. or older because I think I, I started off writing TYA theatre for young audiences encumbered by a lot of preconceptions which were totally my baggage and nothing to do with the audience I thought they'd be scared of certain things they wouldn't go certain places they won't maybe possess the bravery to do certain things um uh, they they didn't have the the uh, the ability to articulate big ideas and it was all totally my bullshit like I I think that <laughs> that kids have time and again proven themselves really rigorous robust audience members able to tackle massive ideas just as in life they tackle massive ideas and massive situations and and my ten year old son is this kind of font of knowledge and and can do huge brave things and and so that was on me so so I let that fall away a few years ago and I think my writing for young people has become better for it because they feel respected in a different way now 
So maybe mm -hmm. that distinction isn't there so much, but with writing theater, I think I was aware of parameters a lot. There are time constraints, there are cast constraints. You need to, there's, there's exposition. You need to explain things in a certain period of time to make the audience mm -hmm. feel comfy. So they'll then go with you to the next ideas in a work and you need to wrap it up in a certain way. You know, it's, there's, a, there's a structure. Even if you try to work against it, I think audiences implicitly have a sense of structures when they're watching a piece of theater. A book just feels like permission. A book mm -hmm. just feels like it can start when it needs to, end when it needs to, go somewhere else in between, sit with a character for a while, set that character aside, go inside their brain, do a macro lens and look at the whole wide world, decide to turn sideways and look at the universe. You know, anything that you need to do, so long as it kind of holds water. Um, yeah, I don't know, there's a shape to it. As long as the reader doesn't feel that they are being totally forgotten, that the writer's just going off on their own um, on their own tangents for no reason that serves the story. I think the story can be very brave and go lots of places. So this mm. is what I'm just discovering. I'm only a couple of years into this whole novel mm. writing lark, but, but yeah, <laughs> I think it's, um, yeah, wild, just wild. Yes. The insight that your characters have and the, the way you express their kind of stream of consciousness and their views of the world, mm -hmm. all of them so different and so clear. How is it that you hold all of those characters in your mind <laughs> and let them pour onto the page in their uniqueness? Mm, I Okay, thank you. That's very nice. Um, uh, I, I was talking with a friend who I'm working on a new a chamber piece with. She's a composer. When we were talking, we realised we both have a thing called... Um, Oh, I can't remember the name of it now, but but I can't picture anything. If I am asked to think of an apple or a beach or or um, uh, my friend's face, I can't see anything. I don't see anything. So I just, I write things, but I'm not, uh, there's not an image evoked and then I'm kind of trying to write what I see. I'm just allowing, I know what the thing is and then I write it into being as, as the words dictate that day. Um, and so I think I did that with all the characters. I, I had no clues about them going in. So I would just sit and wanky as it sounds, I would just listen. I would just kind of wait for them to explain themselves to me. And, and often you have first person address in the book. You, it is people literally talking to you. Um, and, and I kind of just went with that. So I'm like, okay, this is the thing that the person is saying. They're driving forward. They have, they have somewhere they need to go. They have an position that they need to get around. And I will just have faith in the fact that if I write for long enough, they will explain themselves. Then, of course, there was lots of retrospective editing to make that, you know, to give that polish and, and make that be accessible for a reader. But, um, yeah, I think that was essentially what it was. I just kind of met each character as I met them. And and sometimes I would sense an absence in somebody's life. And so I would kind of with intent then go, OK, who might they be ready to fall in love with or who might be the person holding them back? Uh, and so I would sit down with a bit more intent. But even then, it was kind of just uh, an outline created by the absence in this other person's life. And I would allow it to fill itself in. So so, yeah, it was all just quite instinctive because I've never studied, I've never been to uni, I've never learned writing, I've just read lots of books and I have faith in people's voices. Uh, so I just waited to hear the voice and, and make it feel natural. Mm. I, I suspect you are a very good observer of the uh, the human soul and the human condition as well. Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, in my life, I, I interact with a lot of amazing people and I think, yeah, that I mean, it's such a an empowering notion or realization to have at a point in your life that that the best story you will ever hear is from the very quiet person sitting in the pub, you know, who who you need to kind of draw it out from, or you need to have that right moment where they then express the most wondrous thing you've ever heard. And often the grand orators who stand on the stage are the most boring people, you know, and there's just a bit too much polish and intention. Yeah. 
and yeah. and yeah the good story can come from anywhere the amazing rich dense complex life is everybody's everybody has that and we just we just need to do them the service of of listening or being there at the moment when they want to tell yeah fantastic I, yeah listen actively Tell me, from your point of view, uh, once you'd drawn the threads together and uh, put the story, what messages or what threads did you think were important in the end and everything before it? Um, uh, acceptance, I think, I think is essentially just it. Because of the year that I was living, because of the way that mortality was such a presence in my head and in our household at that time, notions of life and death were really butting up against each other. Uh, it was about um, just just being okay, not even being okay with, that sounds too flippant, but just kind of accepting that things would happen as they happened and and finding a way to move through with that and move on with that and to carry hope within that and to 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 feel love and to feel the changing of love and and to know that there are these big grand human existential forces and feelings which are kind of buffeting us all all the time and uh and to try to push back against everything or dictate how things should be is a little bit silly <laughs> maybe <laughs> and and the leaning in is the thing and so that's why I think you know at the front of the book there's a quote um, which I got from this kind of quite uh, troubled Buddhist scholar who kind of started with quite a, a holy uh, life or way of living and then kind of really, you know, went a whole other direction. Like he, he was very human and, and fallible. And he said, yeah, the, the, the bad news is you're falling through the air, nothing to hold on to, no parachute. The good news is there is no ground. And, and I find it amazing. I just find it amazing, that sense of just existing in the world in this moment in time. Um, of course, we can't live that untethered. I have a child that I would like to see grow into a lovely, well-shaped young man. And, uh, and I have all these other relationships that I care very much about. You don't just want to be flitting through life with no attachment to anything at all. But, but that sense of, yeah, we we watch every new moment as it comes along. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, really. No, uh, not only in, in anything wrong. I think there's incredibly right. Humans have such a need for connection, and mm. I hoped that you were going to say hope because for me that was a very much the thread that came through. Is oh. that despite everything, the ups and downs, the waves, the tragedies, the dramas, and yeah. uh, and the comedy, that there was hope. Oh. That that well, yeah. Yeah. That's lovely. Thank yeah. you. That's yeah. really nice. Yeah. Let's go to some practical things because many of our <laughs> listeners are authors and you've written for two hours in the morning at a, at a particular time in your life. What mm -hmm. are the, and besides Larry, who, uh, yeah, is um, was your, your companion there and obviously grew yeah. up over that time, were there any other things that helped your process of writing? Was there music? Was there, obviously there was silence or, but, you know, was there quiet time? What mm -hmm. helps you get into that ready for writing Sure. Uh, that, yeah. that process was actually quite antithetical in that it was a funny moment in time. It was, um, it was, yeah, there was inadvertently a structure was created, but I didn't set out to have a structure. It was kind of, you know, a noisy dog dictating when I should write. Um, <laughs> but really, I'm quite Teutonic. I am a Krukemeyer. I am German. And, and I do like that sense of, of order. So I take my son to school in the morning and then I write for a period of hours during the day and then I pick him up and then we go hang out with mates and we have our life and we eat dinner and do things. Um, so, so actually the regimen of writing, I've always kind of found quite helpful and satisfying. And I write to prescribed hours. I write in a room that feels very comfortable. I, um, I have multiple things I'm working on and, and that might be as a practical thing. I, I don't really get writer's block but I do find that I'm sometimes uh, a certain idea is not proving fruitful anymore. I hit a wall with one particular idea. So then I set that project aside. I turn to another one 
and I find that, yeah, okay, maybe this, uh, this new story that I'm working on or this poem that I'm working on or this screenplay for a film that I'm working on, that one is bearing fruit today. And I switch my focus. And so the act of writing is still there, but it just turned out that that idea, I wasn't in the headset to kind of write in that morose way or that joyful way or that flippant way or whatever it was. Um, so that's been quite lovely to discover. Um, I also... Uh, what other practical things? Every every couple of weeks, I write a series of um, treatments for shows that don't exist yet but could. So they're like one or two page synopses of shows that I might write. And then when I'm talking with producers later on about works that I might make, this is in a theatrical context, I say, well, here's a bit of a, a menu. And I show them a few of these treatments and I say, are any of them of interest? And, and if one of them is I go okay cool let's dive into that one and the story then reveals itself so sometimes I don't give myself the obligation of writing a story from beginning to its end it's just about nutting out what the thing might be about and that be enough for that idea and then I set it aside beautiful all right tell me uh, second books are often <laughs> more difficult <laughs> than first books totally. because the first one kind of pours out and then the second one we feel is obligation to either match or be sequel or whatever so yeah and you give us some outlines of where this <laughs> second novel is it's, totally, at the it's, moment. <laughs> it's a very timely question <laughs> <laughs> okay um uh there was yeah cool there was what i didn't realize i thought you write a book and then if all goes well the book comes to life but of course there's this year in between <laughs> which is the editing period so you're not yeah. writing the book and you're not writing something else but you're kind of you're tinkering away you're having conversations with people you're thinking about you know the the how it will be put out into the world the pragmatics of that and and so I feel I've just breathed out, not from the writing of the book, because that was actually quite long ago now, but this whole thing of, you know, the minutiae of how, how it's rendered and how it becomes a thing that an audience then meets. So I had to do a bit of time of decompressing from that. Um, I wrote some theatre in that time and some other stuff, but to come to the next book, I'm just kicking off now. And I thought that was interesting when you said about, is it a, a sequel or kind of alluding to what's the relationship with the one that's come before. I think that's such an encumbrance because it is so much in your head. Um, and so I realized that the last, the first one, the last one was all about people arriving. A lot of people arriving in a place and what those arrivals mean and the way that they form a patchwork of lives and, and so a place, a community. So I thought, okay, if that was about arriving, what about momentum? What if I write a book which is purely momentum? And so it's what I'm looking at is two protagonists who are moving throughout the whole book. One is moving towards something, a place that they have forgotten but wish to return to. So it, it sounds backwards, but they don't know where it is, so they're moving forward. The other is leaving behind something. They had a tragedy and their, their momentum is to get away from a thing. So, so their aspiration is to create distance. And in doing so, they're both moving. And without encountering each other, each is affecting the life of the other. Things that one is doing is imperceptibly having a quite large effect sometimes on the journey of the other person. So it's the way that we are kind of these kinships exist without being literal. They're not a friendship. They're not a love. They're not parental or childish or anything like that. But without knowing it, you are governing the way that another person moves through the world. So that's what I'm looking at at the moment. That's what I'm about. It's a little it's light, there. fluffy like, piece then. Sorry? <laughs> it's a little light, fluffy piece then. <laughs> yeah, that's right, exactly. It is like there's... Yeah. yeah, there's there's naughtiness to it and stuff. Okay. It, some yeah. some bits of it have levity. They feel okay. They're they're quite cheeky. Um, yeah. But then yeah, there's, yeah. there's death there's... as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, very good, very good. So I just would love you to give us your one piece of advice for authors to begin. Uh, if you know, 
current day, Finn could look back at, uh, you know, past Finn and, and give him one piece of advice uh, when he was about to start writing, what would Mm. it be? Mm. Uh, okay, I think it's the yeah the one which I've tended to kind of sit in and feel not want to take that later on after having said it is <laughs> is have faith in your own voice. I think when we start mm. writing, we often try to emulate our heroes. They wrote the books that inspired us to become writers or made us love reading, and so the first writing we do is a real nod to. those amazing craftspeople and I think that's totally commendable and it's it's good to pay homage and to acknowledge the people who have shaped you but then there comes that lovely moment where you write a sentence or you write a scene or you write a character or a chapter which doesn't bear recognition with anything that you've taken in before and your own voice is starting to show itself and I think in that moment lean in and grab it and harness it and go why is this idea interesting why is this voice turning up what is it trying to say who is this writer because that's you kind of blossoming and taking shape and what a lovely powerful beautiful weird scary moment that is so I'd say love that moment Yeah, fantastic. Excellent advice. Uh, while we're on that, tell me who were the writers that influenced you or who do you love to read? yeah cool um Yeah, you got some bookshelves behind you. uh i'm very german again so it's all alphabetical by nationality <laughs> so these are all the americans yes. uh, there's a big pile of chabon there michael chabon Right, yes. um uh there's a big pile of john steinbeck uh Yes. you can see all the ones that i have multiples of annie cool there so that that's all the americans uh lots of uh, um yeah Lots of Irish writers over there. Um, but yeah, I think I think Steinbeck, I remember reading Cannery Row when I was like nine or 10 and, and really meeting a community. And I think if anything, the end and everything before it is really me Yeah. Mm. without knowing Mm. that I was doing it, kind of trying to manifest a community that feels Mm. as well known, as functional and infunctional as, as that community. Yeah. So, so yeah, I'd say today, Steinbeck. Stomach, very good. And I love your community. I'd love to go and live there. So if you get a portal happening, you know, <laughs> By all means, send me the link and I'll be in. totally. Uh, <laughs> and why should people read the end and everything before it, apart from me telling you that it's a great, compelling read? Tell us why you think uh, it's a good read. Oh, <laughs> uh, I thought your question was going to be why should people read? I'm like, why should people? Oh, no. Oh, no, <laughs> no, no. No, I'm a definite convert there. <laughs> <laughs> um uh people might want to pick up my book um uh it it I think it relates to that sense of permission and acceptance I think it's a story that you're allowed to meet at any moment in life that you want to and hopefully it, it says something to your to your whatever your um taste buds feel like at that moment in time it is about love it is about death it is about healing and hope and coming together and the way that perceptibly or imperceptibly we play a part in other people's lives and that that's a nice thing that you exist as you and you also exist in relation to all the people that you affect and there's nothing wrong with that. Oh, absolutely spot on. Yeah, I would agree with that, having read the fabulous book. Now, Finn, where can people find you online and therefore find your book? Yeah, cool. So um, my website is www.finnegancrookabye.com, which if you can succeed in spelling that ridiculous name, well done. Um, and that's mostly kind of where my plays exist, but also the book is made mention of there too. Uh, I'm published through text publishing. So that's where the end and everything before it exists. And they have just been amazing at holding my hand through this whole journey. They're just a, a wonderful, wonderful publishing house. Uh, it exists as an ebook. It's got a bright orange cover and is covered with feathers. So if you're in a bookshop, you might see it sitting there and it sits in, in all the bookshops that I go and hang out in anyway. So, yeah. Which is good. And we'll we'll put the cover up through the, the interview so that you can see uh, as well, which is good. Sweet. So, Finn, any last words for our audience? No, just thank you very much. This has been really lovely, really Good. nice. Yeah, and it has been wonderful to chat with you. Took us a little while to get it organised and, and thanks to Larry for being so patient in the background. <laughs> is he there? Yes.
So yeah. patient, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take him for a walk now. He's done. That's very good. All right. Uh, so Finnegan Cookmeyer, good luck with the, the sales. And we're really interested to see book two when it does come out. And I'm sure that'll be a little while, but we'll we'll hear about it. So thanks very much and have a great day. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Thanks, Finn. What what a a beautiful, fabulous interview. It was just lovely. You know, mm. magic, the magic of a new creatively uh, creative process that he's finding <laughs> with his, you know, going from uh, theatre um, players to what what's the word? I completely lost it again. Theatre <laughs> playwright. Uh, yes, playwright. <laughs> playwright. Yes. <laughs> but I love that he knew from a really young age that he's. Yeah that he was going to be a writer. I love the permission to write, uh, you know, the intentionality of it, and he just let the characters tell tell him and to lean yeah. into the characters, yeah. Yes, absolutely. And, of course, you could hear Larry the dog uh, <laughs> making his little uh, podcast podcast debut, I think, and um, <laughs> certainly for those watching, they might have got, got to see him. Did, did Larry pop up in there? Uh, I, I don't think I recorded Larry. Oh. We did have a look at him because, of course, I had, you know, Gibbs lying asleep on the carpet. But, uh, yeah, who also has the clearly click nails, but the office has got carpet, so that was a bit easier. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. Well, no, I really – that was a fantastic one listening to, not only as we always talk about with plays and theatre and – but mm. writing, writing so many plays is, is an incredible amount of work. And, you know, I was listening to him talking about writing the treatments – and putting them together, like just writing half a dozen treatments and putting yeah. them together like a menu. And yeah. I thought in in a book way, that would be a synopsis. And I hate writing synopsises. And I can't imagine writing half a dozen synopsis <laughs> to have. I mean, it would be really useful to have and it's a great idea. But gosh, imagine just spending the time writing the synopsises and then putting them as, I want to write the book. <laughs> Yes, but then if you think about your flash fiction, think about yes, it in that true. way. That's true. Because you smash those out every yeah, week. So, I know that's that's. Yeah. I, I'm now I'm I'm now timing myself to see how quickly I can write them. And oh actually wow! Actually, have them be any good? So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Fair they're enough. They're not always. They're not okay. always. It's funny. Sometimes I write a flash fiction piece and and I get a lot of traction on it, and I think, oh, that wasn't one of my best and then I'll write one that I'm really really super stoked about and barely anyone reads it it's like "Hmm, okay okay just never know but also I love the with spinning and talking about that that butterfly effect of of affecting someone else's life without them knowing and having that intersect through with his novel so was a fantastic interview to listen to. It was yeah. was really engaging. That was lovely. Yeah. And every every person's life is fascinating. Yeah. The best story is that quiet person at the pub. Uh, and, and fascinating when he was talking about the fact that he can't visualise images. Yes. I can't yeah. remember what the word is either, but. Yes, there is um, a. There are a lot of people that that yes. have that, and and it's it's fascinating to me that we've got so many different styles of internalising data, and how we see and describe things and and so books are an amazing way to describe things in a different way I guess yeah yeah. Um, putting the words on the page yeah and I've had so many kids actually say you know oh but reading a book is like watching a movie but it's in your head and it's like yeah yeah yeah." but imagine imagine if you can't see it that wow interesting and and there are some people who don't have that yeah and also writing for an audience yes mention that too which I have to admit I do that as well (laughs) I've taken so many notes right I I love it yeah useful writing advice very your focus comedian yes that was fascinating I found that fascinating it's like not only the script tells you we need to get out in front of people yeah uh, some some of us some writers don't yes have faith in your own voice but we are kind of out in front of people yeah yeah but it's interesting a lot of you know a lot of writers are internal and the, yes. they prefer to get the words written and then send it out into the world so it's it's a tough thing having to promote your own work yeah it have is to kind of talk about yourself and yeah. we aren't really trained particularly in Oz to talk about ourselves so it's a uh, it is a different learning style <laughs> it certainly is Ollie it certainly is <laughs> All right. All quote. right. What My quote. quote. Okay. So I thought I'd jump in with with a with a writing quote, and mm-hmm. um, I 
I we've probably said this one before, but Octavia E. Butler, who is one of my favorite writers, oh, you don't yes. start out writing good stuff. You start mm. out writing crap and thinking it's good stuff. Then gradually you get better at it. And given that I'm currently in the process of my final edits for book five, the end of my Stone series. Stone, yes. Yeah, I I can't tell you how many rewrites this one has had. There's been I've ripped it to shreds a few times and it is it's been crap the whole way. <laughs> but it's now taking shape and I'm really pleased with where it's at at the moment and I'm I'm thinking, yay, I might have I might have got to a good a good wrap good up, a good, good end, place. and That's I'm good. really I'm really stoked about it. So yeah, yeah it starts off a mess, but you know yeah. what? Work it, work it, work it, and it comes together. Beautiful. We're going to talk more about that in a future episode, yes. all about our books. Uh, <laughs> we are going to have an episode for ourselves, which, you know, after 125, oh. I think we deserve it. Okay, I'm going to give you a quote from the lovely, the lovely, mm. uh, no, the thoughtful mm. Carl Rogers. Uh, he was an American psychologist, one of the founders of humanistic psychology, mm. um, and when I was thinking about um, acceptance, it, it was and after I w finished chatting with Finn, I went out and I was letting the chooks out and I put the washing on and I was just mm -hmm. having all these words you roll around in my head about, you know, those little moments that he was describing. And the quote is, the curious paradox is that when I accept myself just as I am, then I can change. Mm. Nice. Yeah, that I like was, that. That was, that was kind of spot on. Yeah. That, yeah. That was, yeah. yeah. So there you go. So thanks again. Um, yes. Finn Cook, I might go out and get the end and everything before it. It's on the website and as well as so many other beautiful contemporary stories and as you know from our spotlights, other things. And if you're looking for a great book to buy for Christmas for yourself or for your kids, jump onto the Australian Book Lovers website. We have every genre. We have uh, Aussie books all over and they're just that's such great ideas and the website's getting tweaked and there's yes. been some updates so jump on if you haven't yes. been on for a while yes and once shimmery's finished then my website designer because uh, <laughs> as well as being a theater producer um a, a burlesque performer and putting on you know these world shattering shows she also does websites so she's fantastic brilliant. such a yes. talented girl yes, yes. Uh, she is a, a woman of many talents which is fantastic yes. Yes. uh I am going to say that we need to remember to, yes, to read, read more, more Aussie, Aussie books. Books. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now. See you later. Bye. Let's meet again. When magic happens.